This is Concepts and Focus, a philosophy series by the Acid Horizon Theory Podcast. This series is designed to give you interesting and digestible doses of philosophers and their concepts. In this episode, Adam is going to take us through Hegel's concept of the dialectic, and he's also going to go over the many misconceptions surrounding it. Before we start, please click subscribe. That way you can get this kind of content regularly. Okay, here's Adam. Hello, comrades, and welcome to another episode of Asset Horizons Concepts in Focus. I am Adam, he, him, and I'm here to explain a concept that's particularly close to my field of study, and in a much more pathetic way, my heart. Now, the concept we're going to be focusing on today is the Hegelian dialectic, or simply, the dialectic. If you're hearing it discussed in its post hegelian applications by our Marxist comrades, under the rubric of what they often like to call dialectical and historical materialism. Now, just a couple of first points to note, and in the good Hegelian spirit, both of these points will be incredibly negative. I want to address a couple of myths about what the Hegelian dialectic is. Now, the first myth I want to tackle here is a myth that is not particularly common in the popular understanding of academia, but rather in the sphere of conspiracy theory. So, you know, you're, uh, you're Alex Joneses, you're Ben Garrisons, yeah, some of your Q people too. This is the myth that the Hegelian dialectic is a three-step process used by shady governmental or supra-governmental cabals hmm, to predict and engineer social outcome for the manufacturing of social crises. This is the process that these folks call problem-reaction-solution. Not only are these terms never used, either implicitly or explicitly by Hegel, and have no textual basis, they are, as I said, the three parts of a method of prediction. And Hegel famously left the future as something unknowable from the dialectical standpoint himself. Dialectical philosophy is always a retrospective operation. And this is the considerable breaking point from Conrad Marx. As Hegel said, the owl of Minerva, a symbol for wisdom, only takes flight and comprehends the ground beneath it, the ground over which the dialectical explanation has trodden at the coming of the dust, when it's been and done. And the second myth I want to tackle... And this one will receive a further kicking as we explain the actual process of the Galian dialectic. It's the most famous and the most persistent. Remember, it is another three-step process, and it's the triad of thesis, antithesis, synthesis. We have a thesis, the one side of an argument, or a political position, or a side in a war, or just a simple idea. And then an antithesis comes about in some way or another that opposes it. Under this model, the two then come into conflict, or for lack of a better term, fight it out and produce a synthesis which takes the best parts of the two, or simply fuses them as they meet in the middle. Academically speaking, it's pretty common for Hegel scholars to tire themselves out trying to beat back this model of the dialectic. Anyone familiar would have heard the same tired academics pleading that please no, thesis, antithesis, synthesis is Victor's dialectic, for God's sake. Victor being, uh, in all simplicity, one of the other famous German philosophers working at the time, and uh, one the body of work is, of course, worth engaging with for those seven clients. However, just because it ain't Hegel doesn't mean it hasn't stuck. In Hegel's rare appearances into pop culture, this trope, call it as such, has become the signifier of Hegel's thinking at its purest. It's acquired a Hegelian vibe, that's the shorthand for his entire philosophy. Now, the most ex- music example of this for me is in the game Fallout New Vegas, where the player is thrown into a post-apocalyptic Las Vegas in the midst of an imminent conflict between two opposing ideological factions, that of the liberal democratic NCR and the fascistic Roman-inspired slave state of Caesar's Legion. Now, in the game, Caesar himself justifies the oncoming conflict with this very model of thesis, antithesis, synthesis, as justifying why he must wage war with the NCR, in order to synthesize his own state with it and absorb its better parts while stitching the so-called worst parts, as if there could be any good parts to Caesar's Legion in the process. Now, after this episode, you won't just be killing Caesar for being a fascist bastard in that game, but you'll also be killing him for being a bad Hegelian. Let's just not harp on popular culture too much, this myth also lingers strong in academia and even perpetuates itself when it's openly admitted that it's a myth. My favourite example is is David Chalmers, who, whilst being a fascinating scholar of mine, still names one of his thesis, antithesis, synthesis arguments for panpsychism as Hegelian, because of the extent to which this model has attached itself to the popular imagination. Enough with the negativity so far. 
As Hegel would have put it, the time has come to negate the negation and get some proper dialectics underway. Now, how I'm going to do this is with one simple model. This model, which is my, if my memory is correct, I think comes from your comrade of mine, one Friedrich Engels, is the model of a magnet. Now, this model is great in the first instance because as soon as typically when we try and understand a magnet, we perform an operation in thought that demonstrates what Hegel says when he says the term understanding, which he contrasts to the term reason, which comes later. So when we try and understand the concept of a magnet, the first thing we do is analyze it or separate it into parts. Now, this is the simple operation of saying a magnet is not simply one thing, but a thing made up of two opposed and mutually repelling poles, positive and negative. We understand something by splitting up its parts, by putting each part on one side, as Hegel would put it, and here we split up the magnet onto two sides. Now, we may now seem pretty content. We've fully analysed or understood parts of the magnet. Doesn't seem like there's much left to do now. Um, the understanding, sharp as ever, has successfully cut the magnet in half. Now, the only problem is that staying at this level of merely understanding the magnet won't hold out for very long, if at all. Just saying that a magnet is a positive pole, negative pole doesn't really tell us much. If anything, me and Hegel would say it's a pretty incomplete reading of what a magnet is, especially if we're trying to think through now what are two separated things, a positive pole and a negative pole. Common sense would seem to dictate that we go a little bit further and try to think through what these poles are. So what does it mean to be a positive pole or a negative pole? Now that we've separated them, what in a word is their identity? What makes the poles the things that they are? Truth of the matter is, you won't get very far just trying to think of any one side in the abstract and from either separate position at this point. The best demonstration of this is a pretty simple experiment. Cut a magnet in half, right in the middle, between the two poles, and you don't get two poles, you get two magnets. Each again with a positive and negative side. One pole just can't exist as it is. It can't have its own identity of being either positive or a negative pole without the other, without difference from itself, that which it is not. When you cut the magnet in half, the previous positive side generates the opposing side, the negative pole, and vice versa. And it does so in order to keep existing as that pole. Its identity, for example, it's being positive, assumes or presupposes something different from itself in the form of the other pole, the negative, and vice versa. These poles, positive and negative, as we previously said, uh, are opposed, repellent of each other. We have put them on opposing sides in our understanding, but each is understood to be distinctly not the other. They contradict each other, as Hegel would put it. Yet through this process of trying to analyse them and put them apart, and by trying to follow through of this thinking to the end, we see that this, this opposition, this difference between them, it's mutually that which makes up or constitutes each pole. They are interdependent. The poles are only distinct in their identity because their identity is tied up in that which is different from themselves. Their opposition is literally built into them, a mutual relation of opposing each other, which is also a mutual relation of relying on or referring to each other. Where each pole was set up by us on its own side, or we have negated their immediate sense of being together. That's the simple magnet that we pick up and sense and into the two poles within our understanding. Our attempt to keep them apart in this way has only reproduced their unity and made it stronger in our eyes. To this extent, our original attempt at knowing this magnet failed. And this isn't a bad thing. Failure is a part of the learning process that Hegel thinks is right at the heart of it. This is because in this failure, we learn something about what it is to be a negative or positive pole and how they make this totality up of a magnet. We've seen that each has the root of what it is in being something other or different from itself. We've seen in their interdependence at this first negation, the splitting of the one into two self-identical sides in which each is understood as definitely not being the other. Being absolutely separate has itself been contradicted or negated again. In that their capacity to oppose each other, i.e. for each to be different from the other and to not be the other, is actually built into both sides. And this is what unifies them into what we call a magnet. Insofar as each pole is identified through the other and through the opposing of each pole to the other, their distinctness, as weird as this sound, is also their unity. As we have not only understood it, but comprehended it. Positive and negative are in their difference from each other the same because they can only be what they are, they can only be the same as themselves, 
as positive being positive versus being negative being negative, through the other being different to them, and through each pole sustaining the opposition or contradiction, as Hegel would put it, between the positive and the not positive, between the negative and the not negative. This keeps them in a harmonious kind of continuity with each other. If either pole was to succeed in repelling the other, say if one was able to repel the other such that the magnet broke and the whole thing had pinged off, the pole would equally destroy itself. It's understanding this notion that is so important for a thinker like Marx, where the proletariat only exists as proletarians through their opposite and materially opposed class in the form of the bourgeoisie. The bourgeois class dispossesses the feudal peasants and forces them to subsist on wages given in exchange for the selling of their labour power. On the other side, the bourgeois class sustains itself as bourgeois through its ability to exploit the workers. The two class identities are interdependent, and the system, the totality of their relations and their mutual constitution of each other, is what Marx calls capitalism. Much like in the case of the magnet, should either class eliminate the other entirely, they commit themselves to their own self-abolition. That is why for Marx, the class-conscious proletarian does not want an affirmation or an elevation of the proletarian as the simple end goal of his struggle, but their own abolition as something constituted by the capitalist material relationship to the other classes. Through recognising the interdependence of class relations as inherent to each class position, the oppressed class can start searching for new weapons to bring about the abolition of their own wretched state as well as that of the oppressor and the material relations between them that mutually constitute the other as opposed. This understanding of the opposition or contradiction or tension through which opposed elements generate and presuppose each other is what Hegel calls a dialectical relationship, or a unity of opposites. And the weird little proposition that contains this expression of a contradiction in terms that sustains both terms and expresses this relation is what Hegel calls a speculative proposition or a speculative judgment. It captures uh, the little motion in thinking positive and negative as moving between the other and the mind as each generates or presupposes each other in their opposition and unity in a neat little sentence. It's this ability to move beyond the simple separation or opposition and see the unity in opposition, the contradiction at the heart of identity that shows its unity with difference. That's what Hegel calls the rational or reason. And the ways in which we attempt to try and grasp these contradictions and oppositions in our social existence on this finite earth here, he calls Geist, which is a German for spirit or mind in the sense of intelligence. Now, as you can probably work out by now, we've, uh, we've produced a unity by thinking of the magnet, the unity of its poles, but we sure as hell haven't produced anything that we can think of as a synthesis. Positive and negative poles haven't met in the middle. We don't have a positive-negative pole synthesized if we take the thesis as the positive and the antithesis as the negative. Rather, all we've done is shown each pole is not a separate thesis of its own, but rather a magnet is a collection of antitheses all the way down. Each is only a separate thesis because each is the antithesis of the other. The difference doesn't sink down to nothingness. The distinction is preserved, and yet at the same time, our comprehending of it has been elevated through this preservation. Further, the preservation of their distinction has also suspended or cancelled their distinctiveness, although only in the sense that neither can be kept totally or absolutely apart like we did in the understanding. The first act of negation, the understanding of it, has not been totally lost, because if they didn't have this opposing distinction, they couldn't oppose each other in the way that makes them interdependent. This is the motor of the alien thinking, and of the dialectic as a whole, the negation of the negation rendered in German as the Aufhebung, which contains in its meanings the above terms of suspension, elevation, and preservation, which in English we call sublation. This is the core of the Hegelian motion of thought. Now, it's uh, this process of understanding the difference inherent to an identity that Hegel will go on to deploy and redeploy throughout his work, where he attempts to demonstrate the inability of identity to escape difference, and that all identity holds opposition and differentiation within itself be that the identity of the substance of things or the identity of subjects like ourselves. To be is to be self-differentiating and in constant community and contradiction with one's other. Now this contradiction here has here been talked about in the violent nature of a conflict, but one can equally enjoy oneself through another, and not I, in a way that preserves the distinction between you, whilst both elevating and suspending any total separation in the form of a new unity.
That is what it means when Todd McGowan talks about the dialectical motion of two people making their own satisfaction the satisfaction of the other. Or taking up the Hegelese, love.